the day uh, with us, this uh, special occasion, um, normally only occurs once in a person's lifetime, but sometimes it can occur twice and sometimes three times, depending on what's happened in between times. And uh, so sometimes we do come to a position, a situation, where a person is baptised uh, a second time, third time or so, and I think I baptised someone for the fourth time once. And, uh, you know, the uh, old devil doesn't leave us in peace just because we've decided to become a follower of Jesus. And sometimes he seems as though he's getting uh, the better of things again, and life doesn't go quite how it should. And then, of course, we gain the strength again and then we get back to following the Lord and uh, we want to do something about it, something decisive. And so uh, we decide to be baptised again to make a decisive new start and a new stand. And uh, this is quite right and proper thing to do. <coughs> I'm taking your, uh, your thoughts today to the uh, second chapter of the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2. <coughs> and uh, I want to go down in that chapter a little bit, skip over a whole lot of what is uh, there, and I'll explain it a bit though, and start at verse 36. So we're in Acts chapter 2 and verse 36. This is some of the history of the very early Christian church. Therefore... <coughs> So says uh, the preacher on this day, let all the house of Israel know for sure that God has made that same Jesus whom you crucified, both the Lord and the Christ. Now this is something that uh, we perhaps need a little explanation on. <coughs> the apostle is saying as he is preaching there that God has made the same Jesus whom you have crucified both Lord and Christ. The term Lord comes from a word which uh, in, the Hebrew lang in the Greek language is kurios. And that word means the Lord authority. The Lord who is your authority, the, the boss over you. And so a lot of people were called kurios, not just religious people. A lot of people were called kurios, simply meaning that they were the people who were the lords or the, the supervisors, the bosses over other people were called lords. So God has made this Jesus, we are told, to be lord, to be boss over us, to supervise us. Not a boss as if he were a slave driver, but a good boss. A boss who lets you know what's going on so that you can understand how the work is going. A good boss makes sure that his workers understand the job and they understand why you're doing the job. And uh, a good boss makes sure that the staff, and more and more it's coming that way, that they inform the staff so that uh, the staff uh, can work intelligently and not be in the dark about things. In the old days you worked for the boss and he didn't tell you what was going on and you sort of thought to yourself, well the boss seems to be making a lot of money and I'm not. But these days it's a bit different. So uh, a good boss is uh, <coughs> like Jesus, the Lord, who lets us know what's going on. But as well as being Lord, he is also Christ. And the word Christ is the same word as Messiah. That is the one who is a saviour, the person who saves you from an, a sticky end, we would say in common language. And so the Christ was someone whom the Jewish people were expecting to come because the prophets had talked about it time and time again. And uh, the uh, Christ was someone who would come, a special being, who would uh, be the saviour. In other words, one who would save the people of the world from that uh, <coughs> unfortunate situation where they would all die and never live again. So God has made Jesus the Christ and the Saviour. And so it seems to me as though it would be very good sense to take Jesus as the Lord of your life and recognise that without him you would not have a Saviour and that you take him as your Lord, your boss and also as your Saviour. 
And uh, I think that's what our candidates are thinking today. Isn't that right? You're thinking you want Jesus to be your Lord and you want him also to be your saviour. But before you want him to be your Lord, you'd be much happier if you know he's your saviour. Isn't that right? Because you know he's interested in you. You know that he wants you uh, to be a friend of his so that he can supervise your life uh, in a friendly relationship manner and uh, that you trust in him to save you. <coughs> now when they heard this, when the people heard this, we're in verse 37 now, uh, they were pricked in their hearts and they said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? There were thousands of people listening to Peter and John and the other disciples preaching. Jesus had gone back to heaven. And the disciples of Jesus were left with the job of telling the world about Jesus as Lord and Saviour. And they had just told the people that uh, they were responsible for Jesus' death. The Jewish people were responsible for Jesus' death on the cross. The Romans put him there. Yeah, the Romans did the dirty work. But the Jewish people were the ones who condemned him. And they were the ones who were responsible for having Jesus crucified. And uh, they said, you are responsible for this. And they said, well, what are we going to do? What can we do? We've done it. After all, if you've committed murder, and I hope no one here has committed murder. If you've committed murder, it's rather um, irreversible, isn't it? You can do what you like, but the dead person is not going to come back to haunt you. The dead person is never going to come back in this world. If you've committed murder, there's a sort of a finality about it and you can't do a thing about it. A lot of people can do things to you, but you can't do a thing for the victim of your murder. And the apostle is saying to these people, this great crowd, he says, you people have committed a murder and you can't do anything about it. And they say, well, what can we do about it? We want to do something about it. What can we do about it? And then Peter tells them the only thing that they can do, in verse 38 he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins or the putting away of sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit is sometimes called. That is the only solution. The only solution is to repent, to turn around and take a different course of action. I wonder how many people on the day that Jesus was crucified afterwards said to themselves, I wish I hadn't shouted, crucify him, crucify him. There must have been thousands of people who wished they never went to view that event that day. And they went home wishing they'd never seen what they saw. There must have been hundreds and hundreds of people who went there that day with their families and after the event they said, I wish our kids had never seen this. I wish we'd listened to Jesus while we had him and I wish we'd taken a stand for him while we had him alive because he's dead now and there's nothing we can do about it. There must have been people there who regretted that their one opportunity, it seemed to them, had passed forever. But the solution to the problem of murdering the Saviour is to repent of it. And we've all been guilty. Even though we weren't there on the day that Jesus was crucified, a couple of thousand years later, Many a time each one of us have said, Jesus, you're in the road at the moment. Jesus, you're a problem to me. Jesus, I just wish that you'd get out of the way for a while because I want to do this and I want to do that. Jesus, I like thinking this way. And Jesus is saying, you shouldn't let your mind run on that. And Jesus is saying, you should have a forgiving spirit. And Jesus is saying, you need to do an act of kindness to someone. And you're saying, I don't want to. I don't want to. Jesus, you are in the road today. Go and get out of my life for a little while. Just give me an hour or two without bothering me because I want to do this and that and the other that you know is so contrary to the way that Jesus would do things. 
We've all been there, haven't we? I'm sure if I asked you to put your hand up, the whole shower hands would go up and they'd say, yes, I've been like that. And that's just like crucifying Jesus. Just like being in amongst the crowd and shouting, crucify him, crucify him. And thousands of people were persuaded by the priests and the leaders of the church and so on to get rid of Jesus and they joined in the shout. And afterwards, after Jesus was dead and they went home and they cooled down and, uh, and they started to think about it and they thought, what a fool I was. What a fool. I've committed murder. I've consented to the death of the Saviour of the world. And God gave them another opportunity. God gave them the opportunity to listen to Peter and John and the other disciples on the day of Pentecost and they were fortunate enough to somehow be there on that day. God gave them the opportunity to learn how to deal with the problem of murdering the Saviour. And the solution seems to be so simple. Peter said to them, repent. Change your whole attitude towards us. Repent and be baptised to put away your sins, including the sin of murdering the Saviour. Including the sin of putting Jesus out of your life. And that's probably the worst sin that we can ever commit. You can be nasty to people. You can be uh, bad to yourself. You can be a thief and a robber. You can be an embezzler. You can be dishonest. You can do all sorts of bad things and you can even murder other people. But that's not as bad as denying the Saviour. Not as bad as calling out to crucify Jesus. Because if one continues shouting, crucify Jesus, crucify Jesus... Other people hear the shout as well. And other people are encouraged to move away from Jesus and they lose their opportunity of eternal life too. And we move ourselves so far away from him that we don't even bother shouting crucify him, crucify him because we know that in, his life he's all, in our life he's already dead. And our life becomes empty of spiritual things. And so the apostles said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you. It's open to all of you, all of you people who cried, crucify him, crucify him. The opportunity is there for you to repent, to change your whole attitude. Get this thing right and God will accept you and he will treat you as if you never shouted that call at all. That's what grace is all about. That's what Jesus is all about. No wonder you'd want Jesus to be your boss and your saviour. A boss who will forgive you for all the clumsiness that you, that you do in your life. No wonder you'd want him to be your saviour and to be your leader. And even from, <coughs> from time to time when it seems hard to, to listen to his instructions and to follow his word and uh, to do what he wants you to do, he's still a better boss than any boss you'll ever have in this world. He's still the best boss that you'll ever have, even though sometimes you think in yourself, well, I wish he just wouldn't ask me to do that right now, and I wish he'd give me a little bit more time to finish off this before I do that. But Jesus, no wonder he's the best boss, the best curios in all the world. Verse 39, For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. And so God touches the hearts of people. And the apostle says, the promise is to you and to your children. And so it's not just for us oldies. It's not just for that generation that saw Jesus crucified. It's for the next generation, the next and the next. I don't know how many generations have passed. Multiply about 2,000 years by 40, and you will have, a, divided by 40, and you'll have about the number of generations that have passed since then. And the good news about Jesus is valuable for this generation just as it was for that one back there. Jesus didn't die just for a handful of people, so to speak, back there. He died for all generations. And so Jesus is saying to young people and to children, he's saying to them, repent, get your mind tuned up to me. Think about me, Jesus says. Repent, and then you will feel sorry for the silly things that you do and you will confess to me that you've been so foolish and I'll help you to do the right thing. 
and to get it right. And I'll make sure that I can get you into heaven. And with many other words they exhorted and testified. And uh, <coughs> he said to them, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Some of your Bibles use the word untoward. In other words, it's an old-fashioned word that's, that means this, this crooked, warped generation. Save yourself from the people who have a warped idea about Jesus. Take the opportunity that's here right now to accept Jesus Christ as your Saviour and as your Lord. You know, when I talk about these sort of things, I always know that there are some people who say, well, how do you know that it works? And you know what I say to them? I say, has anything else worked very well? Has anything else worked very well? Did Nazism work very well? Did fascism work very well? Did communism work very well? Did, uh, did uh, um, Julius Caesar uh, and, uh, and his friends work very well? Um, did, uh, did the Kaiser work very well? Did Hitler work very well? Is George Bush going all that good? What about Helen Clark? What can she do for you? to get you out of this life into an eternal life. Has anything else worked very well? And yet we tend to say, well, I can't believe this stuff about Jesus. But I can assure you it's the only thing that's ever worked. The only thing that's ever worked to change your life is Jesus Christ and the Spirit, Holy Spirit that's promised to us. That's the only thing that has ever changed anybody's life, ever changed their attitude, ever changed them from going, crucify him, crucify him, it's the only way that people have ever changed and have repented and have said, Lord, I'm sorry and now I trust in you to take care of me for the rest of my life and take me into your kingdom. Now I want to tell you something about this just in closing. Verse 41, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. The crowd's not always wrong, are they? The crowd's not always wrong. Sometimes the crowd is right. A crowd of 3,000 decided this is the right thing to do. And they were baptized. And they felt the relief and the confidence of knowing that they are safe for eternal life that Jesus has dealt with their sins. He has paid for it for them. He has died for them and he's paid the penalty of their sins and you don't have to worry about it anymore. And when these people were baptised, they, they went down under the water as if it was washing away all the pollution of sin and all the foolishness and stupidity that we get ourselves into, all the bad things we've done, all the bad thinking that we've done, all the bad words that we've said are washed away and are gone. And, uh, and we don't need to worry about them anymore. The scripture says the Lord buries them in the depths of the sea. I don't know how many of you are uh, geographers or geologists or oceanographers or something, but they tell me the deepest part of the sea is something like seven kilometres deep. I think that's right. That's a long way down. That's about as high or higher than you would fly in a jet if you were to go to LA. Um, but it's going downwards instead of upwards. And when you get down there, you can't get back up again unless you're actually winched up or pulled up again, anything that goes down after a certain depth keeps on going down and it can't come back up again. And uh, the scripture says that our sins are buried in the depth of the sea. God knew uh, how deep the sea is. And when our sins are put down there, they had to stay there. And, uh, and someone says, and God puts a sign up there. Uh, I suppose it's floating on a buoy out there, a big sign, and it says, No fishing. When those sins are in the bottom of the sea, you don't go fishing for them. And when other people's sins have gone to the bottom of the sea, you better leave them there too. And don't go fishing for them. There's no fishing. When Jesus has put our sins in the bottom of the sea, there's a no fishing sign. It's not safe to fish there anymore. Because when you pull up sins, you get all the pollution that goes with it. Don't go fishing. They continue, continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching and in their fellowship and in uh, breaking of bread in their communion service and in their prayers. These 3,000 people joined with the church and they became part of what became the Christian church. Thousands and thousands of people became Christians. 
In fact, so many people became Christians in the first 100 years of Christianity that the Roman Empire was alarmed that the whole empire would change to Christianity. And so uh, later Constantine made some rules and laws and so on to try and combine Christians with all the other pagan religions because the Christians were so numerous. There were thousands and thousands. Yes, some were persecuted, some were fed to the lions, some were killed and some were banished from their homes and their countries and uh, the Christians had a hard time but still they multiplied because they saw a vision of Jesus. They saw that the way to deal with their sins was to give it over to Jesus, to be baptized, to start their life anew and to take hold of that assurance that Jesus is the one who can take us through to his kingdom. I just want to ask our candidates today if, uh, if they have that assurance in their hearts. After they've read the, the Bible, they've studied systematically, they've looked at uh, the teachings of the church and so on, and I just want to ask you, can you say you've got that assurance in your heart today? I take that as your affirmation that, uh, that you want to be part of God's church. And you want to be with those people, the thousands and thousands, the millions down through the ages who have chosen Jesus Christ as their Lord, their boss, and as their saviour. God will bless you for this, I'm sure. And we're blessed as we partake in the service today too. And so I'm going to go and change, and just in a few moments you'll see me in, uh, in the font here, and then uh, Pauline is going to come through, and uh, she will come up the steps behind into the font, and, uh, and then uh, Bev is going to uh, follow after Pauline's been baptised. Uh, I notice you've got a lovely little spray of flowers on your gown, and I don't know if the flowers will stand up to the warm water too well. You might like to have your assistant take those off before they go in there, because I don't think roses like warm water too much. So uh, I'll go there. I think maybe you'll be able to sing a hymn while I'm changing, and then you'll see me there. <laughs> 